pressure on the Supreme Court of the United States. As you know, the Supreme Court's term concludes early every summer. And so this moment in July is a propitious occasion to assess where the Supreme Court is at the culmination of its most recent term. This lecture series, of course, is named after Justice Jackson, who served on the Supreme Court from 1941 until his death in 1954. Robert Jackson was a native of this region, born in Spring Creek, Pennsylvania, raised in Frewsburg, New York, a lawyer for 20 years in Jamestown, and from his boyhood until the end of his life, a Chautauquan. A Chautauquan who sat in the audience and listened to speakers, a Chautauquan who came to this side of the podium and became a speaker, uh, actually beginning in the winter session, which is probably one of the lesser venues, uh, working his way up to the amphitheater on the 4th of July in 1947. When Jackson passed away in the fall of 1954, his eight surviving Supreme Court colleagues accompanied the body home to the funeral in Jamestown, to the burial in Frewsburg, and then after a luncheon, they insisted on seeing Chautauqua, something they had heard about from Bob Jackson for many, many years. And so they visited these grounds that October, Chief Justice Earl Warren and seven associate justices. Robert Jackson is notable for many, many reasons. The Supreme Court high on the list, but another, of course, is his service as the chief United States prosecutor of the surviving Nazi criminals in Nuremberg, Germany, during 1945-1946. In other words, 60 years ago. Tomorrow, July 26, marks the 60th anniversary to the day of Justice Jackson's majestic closing argument at the Nuremberg trial. And to weave another piece of the braid, Jackson and Chautauqua, it's my great pleasure to introduce a longtime Chautauqua and a personal friend and a member of Justice Jackson's staff who was in that audience in that courtroom in Nuremberg 60 years ago and who is with us today. Researcher Trudy Levenger, now Trudy Moret. Introducing Linda Greenhouse, I'd like to say a few words about Robert Jackson and newspapers, because Linda Greenhouse, of course, is a leading newspaper reporter um, in the field of her labors, the Supreme Court of the United States. And Robert Jackson was a newspaper guy. He was a newspaper boy. You may not realize that Spring Creek, Pennsylvania, his birthplace, is very close to the home and birthplace of Horace Greeley. And the Greeley family was a fixture in the landscape of young Robert Jackson. Because of the Greeley connection and because of, I think, the thirst for knowledge, Jackson's family always subscribed to Greeley's New York Tribune and then later added the New York uh, World. I'm not sure they ever added the New York Times for home delivery in Spring Creek, Pennsylvania. But when Jackson began his rise, he became, of course, New York Times material as someone to be covered and as a source. And Jackson's network of close com communicants, advisors, and friends came to include a lot of New York Times correspondents, names from an era past but known to many of you. Arthur Kropp, Raymond Daniel, Cy Salzberger, Anne McCormick, and to bring it particularly to the Supreme Court, Lewis Wood. Lewis Wood, who was, and I paid him a very high compliment, in his day, the Linda Greenhouse of the New York Times. <laughs> to Jackson, he was Louis, uh, and they corresponded regularly and met regularly and had a channel of communication that I think was entirely appropriate but really quite helpful to Jackson in his work as a Supreme Court Justice. That's an unknown, somewhat invisible, but I think very important part of what a great Supreme Court correspondent encompasses. Now, Linda Greenhouse, since 1978, has been the New York Times' Louie Wood. She covers the Supreme Court of the United States uh, with a slight break, has, has had that term since 1978. She came to that from a distinguished career, a uh, graduate of Radcliffe College, uh, a recipient of a year of training at Yale Law School in their journalism program, other New York Times reportorial assignments. But since 1978, she has been the Supreme Court on the pages of the New York Times. And I don't think that that is an overstatement. Um, I think of it this way. When Justice O'Connor retired last summer, of course, President Bush appointed John Roberts to succeed her. And then in the turn of events, when the Chief Justice passed away, Roberts became the Chief Justice nominee, and Justice Alito became the O'Connor successor. 
And Justice O'Connor's comment at the end of that process was a high compliment to Sam Alito, but a regret that he is not a woman. And one response would be, well, that's okay. The Supreme Court still has Ruth Bader Ginsburg and Linda Greenhouse. <laughs> but I must say that it strikes me that that's a sexist response. That assumes that there's something special in biology and sufficient in two, if that's the right number. I don't mean it that way. I really think that there's something uh, bigger and more valuable that Linda Greenhouse stands for. The Supreme Court, in its configurations over the last 20 years, a long time of stable membership and now a time of new membership, uh, has of course been nine justices, but is surrounded by a network of very important inside players. Some of them are the lawyers, government and private, who regularly appear before the court. But for our purposes as citizens, our court becomes ours as we learn about it. And the journalists who deliver that court to us really perform a Supreme Court function. And so frankly, for myself, and I know for everyone else in my business, constitutional law, legal academia, the Supreme Court is at least 10 as it communicates to us. And it is a great pleasure to welcome Wendy Greenhouse, the New York Times Supreme Court correspondent, to tell us about that institution today as Robert Jackson. Thank you. Did you ever get a sense that, you know, when you were in college that you'd end up in this type of role, of job description? No, no. Um, I had very little sense when I was in college of what I was going to end up doing because, you know, I was in college in the 60s and there were not female role models really anywhere, you know. I spent four years at Radcliffe, which is, you know, Har Harvard, and in the four years I had one female professor who was untenured, in fact did not get tenure, went on to a distinguished career elsewhere, but, you know, so just looking around, I didn't know, s I, I never met a woman who was a lawyer until after I was out of college. So um, my mind was kind of blank, actually, as to what I might end up doing. I worked hard and lovingly on the college paper, on the Harvard Crimson, and I thought I would like to go into journalism. I was a Harvard stringer for the Boston Herald newspaper, uh, but they would not give me an interview for a full-time job, although they had printed my stories. Um, so it was a bit of a... And I didn't want to go to graduate school. I wasn't interested in getting a PhD, which was a default. Uh, choice for, you know, a number of my female friends, um, but I knew I didn't want to do that. Um, so I was just kind of wondering what was going to become of me, and somebody told me that James Reston, who was then, you know, a very prominent uh, editorial columnist for the Times, had his own private internship program where he would take a kid right from college for a one-year clerkship, if you will. He sort of modeled it after a Supreme Court clerkship. Um, so I applied and he hired me. And I like to say I owe my career to the war in Vietnam because he had not hired a woman, but he had had a couple of young men get drafted because working for him was not a draft deferment. So uh, that opened his eyes to the prospect of hiring a woman. So anyway, he hired me and <coughs> I worked for him for a year and again had no particular expectation of what would become of me after the year, but I did get a chance to sort of have a, a trial uh, on the Metropolitan staff of the Times and um, stayed there for nine years. They sent me to Albany, so I got to know and love upstate New York. Um, I worked in the Albany Bureau for four years. I was the bureau chief for the last two of those years. It was a very exciting time in the mid-70s when New York City was collapsing and you remember Ford to New York, drop dead, all that stuff. So it was very high stakes, uh, consequential stuff going on and the journalism was quite important because everybody was on a very steep learning curve you know about municipal finance and so on and it was an important story to get out there um, and after that I asked for a transfer to Washington and ended up covering the court so none of that was uh, part of some grand design it was just one foot after another you talk about role models uh, was a Helen Thomas part of your scope at all I mean she's really one of the deep person does to cover the presidency. Exactly. Right, right. I mean, I guess I, I saw her on, you know, at presidential press conferences uh, on television, but um, I certainly didn't know her. Uh, in fact, I don't know her. Um, but, you know, women 
women in prominent journalistic positions were just awfully few and far between. First day you walk into the Supreme Court, you know, with the stenographic pad in hand, uh, what did you feel? You, you, were, you were young? Yeah, uh, and yeah. Female, and there were no females, uh, certainly on the court. That's true, that is true. Um, well, I felt, you know, awe, trepidation. Um, I had prepared for it for a year because the Times uh, sponsored me on a fellowship to Yale Law School. So I was essentially a first-year law student for a year. It was a terminal one-year master's program. So I did end up going to graduate school. Um, so I had, you know, designed a program that was going to teach me a lot about constitutional law in the court, but of course there's a huge gap between learning and, and, and doing. So I knew, I knew cases, I knew the current docket, I knew stuff, but I certainly didn't know kind of what to do exactly. Um, and it was actually, it was very interesting because it was in the fall of 1978. The New York Times and the other newspapers were in fact on strike. It was the last big newspaper strike. It started in August of 78. I came down to cover the court in September to get ready for the term. The strike went on in September, went on in October, and lasted until November. So during that time, not having any income, uh, but feeling that I, obviously the paper, the strike was going to end, and obviously the papers were going to continue publishing and covering the Supreme Court, that I, it was really in my own long-term interest to, to keep working at it. So I just kept going to the court, even though I wasn't getting paid and I wasn't publishing anything. Uh, a couple of new legal newspapers were starting up then, the um, National Law Journal, mm -hmm. which is now very established, part of some big media conglomerate, but um, it was a, a startup. And they didn't have anybody uh, covering the quarter. They didn't have much of a staff. So they hired me during that strike period to write a weekly summary of all the cases that the court was granting. So that was great because I got paid, but I also got to learn without the pressure of the daily deadline. So, um, and it was a very busy period. The court in those days was taking twice the number of cases they take today. Today they take about 80 a year. Then they were taking 160. So on a weekly basis, there was a lot going on and I could sort of climb that learning curve um, with a bit of a safety net because I was just doing it once a week. So by the time the Times came back to publishing around mid-November of 78, I was really fully up to speed and that was a good, I haven't thought of this for a long time, but that was a, you know, a good period, learning period for me. This was the Warnberger Court. It was Warnberger Court. And, and who, do you recall the, the, the eight other justices? Yeah, I should be able to because um, the first vacancy that occurred was in um, 81 when Potter Stewart retired and was replaced by Sandra Day O'Connor. So it was um, Berger, Blackman, Brennan, Marshall, White, Potter Stewart, Lewis Powell, John Paul Stevens, and who am I le leaving out? I'm leaving out somebody because that's only eight. Rehnquist, it? Rehnquist, thank you. Of course, how could I forget him? Rehnquist, okay, so that's who it was. So it was, um, it was a court that really didn't have a center of gravity because uh, Brennan was still pretty powerful. He was going to remain for another 12 years. He, wa he wasn't young, but he was very vigorous uh, intellectually. Um, so a lot of things were up for grabs, and um, that is thunder. That is not the war in Iraq coming to Chautauqua. Uh, <laughs> so, you know, things were not predictable. Necessarily. Well, the, the balance was very tight, tightly held, as, as uh, witnessed by the Bakke decision, which had come down in June of 78, just before I started covering the court, which was four to four and Lewis Powell in the middle on the future of affirmative action in higher education. So uh, the court was really split, and it was a interesting uh, period opening then. Did the justices pay much attention to you? No, no. Um, I didn't really form any particular relationships with any of them at that time. I guess I had, remember I had lunch once with Potter Stewart. Um, I had a couple of nice chats with Justice Brennan, but um, 
no. And, and that was uh, kind of a shock and a disappointment to me because, of course, covering Albany, anybody who's covered any political body from, you know, a city council to a state legislature to the U.S. Congress, you're constantly mixing it up with, with the newsmakers. Uh, and you have a kind of a symbiotic relationship, in fact. They use you as a source of information. You use them, and they tell you stuff. And it's a lot of fun. And I had a very good time in Albany at that, at that very you know, raucous time. And so to go to the Supreme Court and sit in the press room, once my stuff started getting published, you know, when the Times came back to publishing, I would you know, never get any feedback. And when you're covering politics, they'll call you. If they don't like what you've written, they'll call you up. And they'll say, you know, what are you, some kind of idiot? Well, not necessarily pleasant, but it's a it's a feedback loop and a kind of a reality check. So you can kind of take it or leave it, but at least you know what they're thinking about it. Um, with the court, uh, you know, silence. So I guess I comforted myself by thinking that if I had made a huge blooper, I somehow would have heard about it. But anyway, I, you know, over time did get to know many of the justices, although there's you know, a number of them that I don't necessarily talk to from one end of the year to the next, um, but some I do, so. How, how do they get the messages out to you? Do, do, do you really look for feedback from inside the court at all? Or is this set up in a s system where you're watching, observing, reacting, reporting without the benefit of any, I don't say, insight uh, from either law clerks, press people from the Supreme Court? Oh, well, I mean, law clerks I really have no contact with. I mean, they're not supposed to talk to us, and they don't. I mean, these are ambitious young people who don't want to mess up. So, um, no, I'm always surprised when people think, oh, you know, you must have sources among the law clerks. No, I don't never meet the law clerks. Uh, the press operation, which is a very nice, friendly group of people, they don't actually know anything substantively. They don't, ha they don't have an inside track. Um, so they're not... I mean, they're helpful on, uh, you know, certain procedural or calendar type of issues that are, you know, public but not necessarily all that accessible. But in terms of, you know, what's going on inside the court, no. They, so, um, no, my work is really um, just paying very, very close, sustained attention to events that are available to anybody. I don't have secret information or inside sources. Um, but I'm there all the time, and I look at every piece of paper that floats around and, um, and just try to do the best I can at putting two and two together and figuring out what's up, but it's not the result of anybody um, helping me. You're listening to oral arguments. Uh, in anticipation of the oral arguments, uh, do you get to add the abstracts of the lower court decisions? Are you, are you, you, well, you don't have access to the briefs. I do. Oh, do sure. Oh, yeah, the briefs are public documents. Oh, yeah. I, I Prior to the... Uh, oh, sure. Oh, okay. No, no. Um, the briefs come in... Well, to backtrack, I mean, if I'm doing my job right, I get familiar with the case before the court grants it because uh, the court takes in about 8,000 uh, petitions. They're called petitions for certiorari every year. And all of those are public filings. And we get in the press room um, a weekly list of those cases that are ripe. That is to say, both sides of the argument have come in. You should take it. You shouldn't take it. Uh, the weekly list of cases that are going to the justices for their weekly uh, Friday conference. And I look at all of those. I don't look at all the, the ones that come in from the prisoners because they tend, that's like finding a needle in a haystack. But I look at every what's called paid case. So that's a few thousand a year. Uh, I, I log it into a docket book, which I keep, and I make a note to myself as to whether it's something that I think the court's going to grant. And they, as I say, they only grant about 80 a year out of 8,000, so it's a, it's a big deal if the court grants a case. They're really setting the country's legal agenda when they do that. So sometimes it's, it's, it's often newsworthy if the court grants a case. Not always. It can be a very technical procedural thing that for a general readership is not interesting, but anyway, it's uh, some kind of event. Uh, sometimes the case is newsworthy if it's denied. Some big controversy and the court's not going to hear it and that's the end of that. So I keep track of all that. So when a case is granted, again, if I'm doing my job right, I know the case, I've read the petition. So then a case is granted and then after a certain amount of time, 30 days and 45 days, 
the briefs are due and the briefs come in and in advance of the argument, again, if I'm doing my job right, I read the briefs and there can be um, dozens of briefs because the amicus briefs come in, not only the parties' briefs. Uh, in the big Michigan affirmative action case a couple of terms ago, there were more than 100 briefs. Now, I didn't scrutinize every page of 100 briefs, but I, I, I looked at each one to you know, satisfy myself that it was or it wasn't making some kind of new argument. So I never go to argument without having done that. If I haven't gotten around to doing it, I don't go to the argument because I can't, I'm not smart enough to understand the argument unless I'm prepared and done my homework and I know where the questions are coming from or I know uh, what questions maybe are not being asked, what arguments in the briefs don't seem to have grabbed the court's interest, um, what kinds of questions come out of the blue and you wonder where'd that come from? That's not in the briefs, that kind of thing. And you really have to go prepared to get anything out of the argument. Do you, is it, is there a correlation from the questioning from the justices and how that opinion ultimately finds final form? Often there is, sometimes there's not. And of course you never know which it's gonna be. Right. Um, some justices are m more likely to tip their hand. Um, Chief Justice Rehnquist, you knew where he was coming from. He didn't ask many questions. When he did, he really, he really tipped his hand. Chief Justice Roberts is a little more opaque. You know, he had a, a long career as a very effective advocate before the court, so he knows what a good question is. And you don't know whether he's asking a question as a devil's advocate just to draw the lawyer out, or whether he's really saying, look, here's how I see it, can you respond? It can be either one, so he's not, he's not, his questions are very astute and good, but he's not as useful as a predictor. So, um, most of my argument stories, I say, are not predictive, because I'm not confident of a prediction. When I'm confident, they are predictive, and I'm always right because I'm, I'm very um, cherry of predicting. So I only do it when I really think I'm right. And, and I guess the one I was sort of proudest of this term was the big Texas uh, redistricting case, which was a two hour argument. It was very opaque. And I came away and I wrote a story and I said, they will not find that this midterm redistricting is impermissible partisan gerrymandering, but they are very concerned about what happened with the dismantling of the majority Latino district in South Texas, and they are likely to find that that was a violation of the Voting Rights Act, and that's what happened. Yeah. And I was, I felt pretty good about that, because that was not a very obvious call. You want to go to Vegas with me? <laughs> I'll go to Saratoga with you. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> you, you've been covering the court for how many years now? 28. Uh, of that, there have certainly been personalities, a variety of personalities on the court that you've seen not only from the, the, the nine you mentioned earlier, but subsequently, including the day Justice O'Connor uh, you know, was, was first made her appearance. Let me just pause there for a second. Uh, did that mean anything to you, being a, 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 a female, seeing a female justice? It, it, meant, it meant a lot to me. It meant more to me than I would have expected. It meant more to me on a subconscious level than I think I was aware of. And the reason I, I can say that is um, I had dreams about her. Ah. It really, it just got to me at a subconscious level. I guess I'd been covering the court for three years at that time. And, um, you know, I didn't know much about her. The world didn't know much about her. I've learned a lot more about her since because she wrote a very interesting childhood memoir, Lazy Bee, about growing up on a ranch a few years ago. And that was very revealing. Um, you know, she was a kind of, seemed to me like the sort of country club Republican from the suburbs of Phoenix, and I didn't think I would have had much in common with her or anything, but just the fact that she was there just really um, kind of spoke to me. So yeah, that was significant. Do you have any reason to, uh, to socialize with her? Do you have any reason to socialize with the justices? I, I, you may have answered that, but... Uh, well, I mean, not sort of, you know, hang out and let's go to the movies, but um, I see some of them at, at public events. Um, 
you know, certain dinners or whatever, and, um, you know, a couple of them, I'm kind of free to call them up and say, you know, if you're not doing anything, can I come up and just chat for a few minutes in chambers? So that's rewarding. I mean, they never, I should say, they never tell me anything, you know, inside, like, you know, next week we're gonna, you know, whatever. But, you know, it's just, I sort of take the temperature of the court in that way. Um, so I've certainly run into Justice O'Connor um, over the years, and we've actually worked on a couple of projects together. Um, um, she and Justice Ginsburg allowed me to um, interview them on stage before a big audience. Uh, last October, it was an international meeting of the network of women's forums that I'm involved with. The, um, it's called the International Women's Forum, and they have a big uh, worldwide meeting every year, and last fall it was in Washington, and the program committee asked me if I could possibly put together a program with the two justices who are members of the Women's Forum, and um, so they were awfully sweet, and it was a sort of a, you know, capstone event of the conference, just the two of them and me, and um, so we've, we've done a few things like that, so yeah, I've gotten to know her a little bit anyway. Do you know enough not to know when not to ask, when, what questions not to ask? Or do they tell you? I'd appreciate if you wouldn't ask. Well, I'll tell you an anecdote and answer that. I mean, yes, I generally. I mean, I certainly wouldn't say, you know, can you tell me the real behind-the-scenes story of X, as much as I'd like to know it, or, you know, or I could say, you know, gee, I'd love to know the story behind that, but I guess I'll have to wait for your papers or something like that, you know. But um, I was talking to Justice O'Connor around January of this year. She was still on the bench, but she got, was going to be leaving within a couple of weeks because uh, Sam Alito had been or was moving toward confirmation. So I said to her, you know, this must have been a really odd several months because you announced that you wanted to retire in July, and here's January, you're still here, you, you know, you've been hanging, hanging on, and, you know, it must have been strange. So she said, well, I'm glad I was here, actually, because it's been very interesting. Uh, to see the, the new court unfold and uh, to see, I forget how she put it exactly, to see how the new chief is different than the old chief. So seeing my opening, I said, how is he different? And she kind of pulled back and she said, well, that's probably all I should say. So that's how they'll handle something yeah. if they don't really, yeah. yeah. Why the obs obsession I guess was the opportunity to do the book on Harry Blackman. Well, I wouldn't say obsession. The book, it, it, was, a, it, it was a target of opportunity, mm -hmm. really. Um, I mean, it wasn't that I'd been walking around for years saying, I can't wait to do a biography Black. of Harry Blackman. What happened was um, Harry Blackman left his papers to the Library of Congress with the stipulation that they be closed for five years after his death and then open to the world. So he died in March of 1999. So they were going to be open in March of 2004, and the Blackman family was quite concerned that the opening day would just be a mob scene in the reading room of the Library of Congress Manuscript Division because people would be grabbing, you know, give me the Roe against Wade folder, give me this, give me that. And they just didn't want that. So they came up with an idea that they would offer a journalist a two-month head start in the papers, which are voluminous. It's half a million documents. 600 linear feet on the shelves of the library. Uh, let somebody go in there for two months, do whatever. I mean, they obviously weren't going to control the product, uh, with the only condition being that it couldn't appear before the paper, until the papers were open to the world. And that way they hoped that they could enable somebody to write a coherent account of the man's life, not just a one-day deadline kind of thing. So I was lucky enough that they made an overture to me, you know, would I be, would the Times be interested in, in doing that? And of course I was, although, you know, logistically it was quite a challenge. And once I realized the dimensions of the project, two months was not a very long time. But I did that um, very intensively and produced a series for the Times and then got a, a book offer um, that I didn't solicit, just, you know, came from a very smart book editor at Henry Holt. Um, so I then got a very brief uh, leave for the summer of 2004 after the court term finished to turn the series into the book. So that's how it happened. Why did they select, why did the family select you? 
Well, I don't know exactly. I think because uh, it's the New York Times, uh, because I did know the justice and his wife, not intimately, but I think we had a nice relationship. And because um, the his former law clerk, who was sort of in charge of advising the family on what to do, Harold Coe, uh, who's now the dean of Yale Law School, then he wasn't yet the dean, uh, but was somebody I knew, had known pretty well over the years. So I think just, you know, events made it, it was a logical uh, choice for them. You want to observe Justice Blackman on the court from your start in 1978. Uh, what surprises were there as you were rifling through this to say, oh my gosh, I had no clue, or well, of course, the, his, the public trajectory of his career, um, his journey, as I call it in the title of the book, was, you know, was that wasn't a surprise because that was obvious in his published writings and, and the life of a, of a judge really is in their published opinions. So, so that basic thing didn't surprise me. What was very surprising was a couple of things. One the nature of his relationship with Chief Justice Warren Berger. Again, I knew the outline. I had written both of these men's obituaries at length. So I knew they grew up together as, as young childhood friends in St. Paul, Minnesota, that Blackman was best man at Berger's wedding, um, and that they ended up very estranged for reasons I didn't know. But what's in the papers are several uh, troves of correspondence between them that charts uh, an incredibly intense and close relationship into their middle age until they get on the court. And then you can kind of chart the disintegration of the relationship. So that was very fascinating. And what I also had no reason to expect, and I don't think the family knew this either, was that he had saved not only all this court stuff, and, and everybody knew he was a great pack rat and saver of court material, but uh, material from his early life, including a childhood diary that he started keeping at the age of 11 and kept into his 30s when he was an ambitious young lawyer. And so as a biographer, you just see um, the man's life in a way that I totally didn't expect. He also kept what he called a chronology of significant events for every year that he was on the court, 24 years. He would just take an ordinary piece of paper and write, just j make little notes with a date, and anything that occurred, not only on the court, but in the world, in his personal life, that he just thought was, he just felt like noting it down. So, so one of the first things I did was just Xerox, this about 50 pages covering these 24 years, and uh, it, it sort of gave a reflection of the world through his eyes that was very useful as marking things that I wanted to search for in the archive as a whole. You really selected, I think, four themes uh, to focus in on the book. Right. So, um, how early did that come to you as saying, those are the four, obviously the, the burger, the Blackman theme, the robe jumps out, uh, but you also got into the, uh, the, the sexual discrimination part of it. Right. So, well, the death penalty part, I guess. Right, I mean, going in, I have to say there's a 300-page index of the collection, so obviously some strategy was needed for plunging in. So, you know, obviously abortion, obviously the death penalty, and, and obviously the sex discrimination cases because of the abortion cases. So that's what I sort of figured were going to be the most uh, fertile areas for, to, to look at. The Warren Berger stuff um, just jumped out at me from the quality of the, of the correspondence. And so the series that I wrote for the Times had an entire, really half of it was the Warren Berger material, just because in human terms it was so rich and interesting. So that came right out of the papers. And the, um, the sex discrimination stuff, although obviously I knew it would be an important part, I didn't, I didn't know what the story was. And it wasn't clear until I went through the cases what a reluctant soldier he was in the sex discrimination fights of the 70s and 80s and the extent to which for him the abortion issue was really about the rights of doctors much more than the rights of women. So you see him really 
with an open mind, but yet with the predilections of a quite conventional 65-year-old man working through this notion of sexual equality as a constitutional principle that Ruth Ginsburg, who was a young civil rights lawyer at the time, was arguing to the court in a series of cases, and Blackman wasn't getting it right away. He didn't get it till rather later, and so the, the convergence of these two lines of cases, the right to abortion and the right to, and women's right to equality, didn't merge for him until rather late in the game, and that gave it a kind of a, you know, dramatic tension to that tale of evolution that I, I had not expected. Right. Is the, the fact that you talk about his, his conventional thinking premised basically on his days as a, as a general counsel of the mayor, I mean, I, that's, that's where his world came from. Um, did you get a sense that from the Roe versus Wade decision and uh, that he was put into a position to further by assigning him the decision the opinion writing put into a decision which he just felt completely uncomfortable almost right to the very end? Well, the, the thesis that I ultimately came to is that it was the experience of writing Roe and of dealing with the world's response to Roe that um, propelled him into the, the lifelong evolution that then occurred. So I think Roe was critical, and I think um, without Roe, we might well not have seen the Harry Blackman, the justice that he became. Uh, you know, there's a the concept in economics and social science, path dependence. Mm -hmm. And I think you can really um, fit his life story from 1973 on as a kind of a path dependence. Had he not written Roe, he would have not gone down the, the path that, that Roe led him to, you know, becoming, he ended up at age 85, the most liberal justice on the Supreme Court, he, which was in, by no means predictable. And I can, the, the book or, or actually the talk I'm going to give uh, this afternoon kind of charts that in more, in, in more detail. So it wasn't, I don't, he was never uncomfortable about, about Roe, you know, he never had second thoughts about it. And I think what's important to, for people to, to know or to remember is that in writing Roe, he was speaking for a broad majority of the court. The vote in Roe was seven to two. This wasn't anything that he foisted on the court or that the court particularly struggled with. I mean, the main struggle for the court in Roe was the kind of jurisprudential one. Um, you know, how to exercise our jurisdiction. Is this properly the business of the federal courts? But not you know, there wasn't a big internal debate about, you know, the rights of the fetus or the unborn or the moral issues. It really wasn't. I mean, the two dissenters, White and Rehnquist, um, their dissent was really, you know, this is just not our concern of the, you know, it's, let's not constitutionalize this. It wasn't because the, the abortion debate today with all of its emotional overtones um, was not the debate then. It, it's, um, it's easy to, to be anachronistic about it. But um, it didn't look then th to these middle-aged white guys, well, Thurgood Marshall also, these middle-aged guys, uh, the way it looks today to, to many people the, in, the, in the aftermath of the intense politicization and exploitation of, of the issues. So Roe itself didn't trouble Blackman, but the, um, the aftermath where he was both, uh, you know, hated for it and lionized for it, none of that made any sense to him because he had spoken for the court. It was an assignment. Somebody else might have gotten the assignment. He happened, his name happened to be on the opinion, but so were the names of all the people who concurred with him. Jeff Stone talked a little bit about that uh, when he was here, because uh, he was Brennan's clerk at that time. Oh, he was that, that very term? Yeah. Oh, I didn't know that. And, and, uh, of, of how you know, the, the Brennan uh, Connection, which I, I you wrote that in the book as to Blackman's reaction when it was thought that maybe Brennan had more of a, a say in this than, than Blackman and his right. reaction to rubbish. Or something like that. Right. Now, what? But what did Jeff Stone say about uh, that? He, he thought Brennan perhaps had a little more involvement than that, that reaction would have led itself to. But he also talked more about the post role decision reaction. I think he talked about two things. Uh, one is that Brennan, you know even though he was Catholic, 
you know, he, that's, he went on, he didn't read his mail, he didn't see any of this. Right. And yet he really concerned himself about Blackman because he could see the lights were on and, and Justice Blackman would spend time anguishing over the letters. And yes. It really hit him personally. It did. And that was one of you know, Jeff's real uh, reactions to the Roe versus Wade and how it really hit him personally. That's really interesting because you'll see in, in my talk, I, I talk about how Blackman brooded over those letters. He saved every one, tens of thousands of them. He gave them all to the Library of Congress. And I say, you know, a Justice Brennan would not have done that. And I didn't know what Jeff had said, but, you know, just knowing Brennan, Brennan wouldn't be brooding over this. Brennan wouldn't have bothered with it. You know, he said what he said. He voted the way he voted. Let's get on with it. Next case. You know, so, so I think it was Blackman's personality structure as much as anything else that um, led him to respond the way he did and to kind of make the choices he then subsequently made. The other anecdote, I mean, you might have known about this, might have been involved in it, I don't know, but um, there was a reporter who was working with one of the law clerks trying, as anticipation of what... Oh, you know, I, well, of course, I wasn't there at that time, but... Um, Yes, there were. There was a leak in Time magazine. It was David Beckwith, I think. I hope I'm not slandering anybody, but I think that's who it was. Um, famously, had a leak about Roe. Well, you know, the case was pending for a year and a half um, or more. You know, because it was reargued. Uh, so there was a lot going on there, and there were lots of people that knew things, and there were. You know, two generations, two terms worth, or three terms worth of law clerks that were had their hands on it. So yeah, it's not surprising. Well, anyway, it's just interesting to have Jeff's perspective of this. I had not heard the story. Uh, literally, how they're waiting, and you mentioned about it in the book, they're waiting for Burger. Where's Burger? Where's Burger? Yeah. Burger? Yeah. And it was uh, presumed, and you talk about the fact that it was anticipated it would be announced on a, a certain Monday. But where's Burger? Where's Burger? And it was uh, a, cl a clerk who remained nameless. I, I don't know. Anyways, when they're telling the story, you have to talk to the Times Gallery. It's going to happen, and these are some things you're going to hear. Uh, and of course, Berger didn't give the uh, his views on it until afterwards, and then he announced that it was going to be postponed. Too late to get Times to retract the story. Oh. The Times story went with it, and all hell broke loose internally. And it was, so that story, the fun story for a, a history guy like me, and oral history guys, that is. What the hell went on? You know. Yeah. <laughs> Imagine. Uh, yeah. Well, of course, I mean, Blackman's view, and I think Potter Stewart's view also, was that Berger was deliberately holding it up until after Nixon's second inauguration. Not, I mean, why? I don't know. But maybe because, of course, Berger was a Nixon appointee, Blackman was a Nixon appointee, Powell, who was in the majority, was a Nixon appointee. So, um, you know, maybe holding it up not to embarrass the president. Yeah. Did, did you get a sense that as time progressed and some of his colleagues that either died, retired, uh, who supported Roe were now being replaced by uh, justices where it may not be so clear as to where they would fit, that that was a concern now of Blackman? Even though he had received the assignment and now his name had been imprinted with Roe, with that um, philosophy? And now he had to be the standard bearer? Oh, completely. Yeah. yeah, no, he completely assigned to himself the mission of saving the right to abortion. I mean, he was the father of the right to abortion in his mind, ultimately, and he was going to save it. And he was extremely suspicious, close to paranoia, about the advent of the new justices. And in fact, one thing that was interesting was that that I saw in the papers that I would not have anticipated was the behind the scenes role <coughs> of John Paul Stevens, who I never had much associated with this issue, but he was the one who was much calmer and more strategic. And he would say to Blackman, look, don't write off Sandra O'Connor, David Souter, you know, they're not necessarily going to vote to overturn Roe. Don't assume that they are work with them. We can all work together. Just stay cool. I mean, he didn't put it exactly that way. That was the message. Because uh, Blackman was really um, just in despair in those years, just thinking, 
it was all going to be wiped out. And of course, ultimately, uh, it was saved by, in the Planned Parenthood against Casey decision in 92, by the coalition of three rather recently appointed Republican justices, O'Connor, Souter, and Kennedy. Uh, Blackman didn't really have anything to do with that. That was their own business. They came to him and told him this. And it was then John Paul Stevens who was the kind of go-between between, between Blackman and the, the trio uh, in working out the final opinion in Planned Parenthood. I think without Stevens, it would not have been the, the you know, strong reaffirmation of the right to abortion that it ended up being. Death penalty. I don't want to say there was an, an epiphany, but at some point, Justice Blackman came to the view that he was going to make a very public statement. What, what was the background of that? Can you give a little? Well, yeah, the death penalty story um, did surprise me in a couple of significant respects, even though we all knew, I mean, the world knew a couple of things. The world knew that Blackman, in his very early years on the court, was a dissenter in Furman against Georgia. That was a 72 case that, that uh, declared unconstitutional every death penalty law in the country. Blackman dissented. But yet, months before he announced his retirement in the spring of 1994, uh, he issued this famous dissenting opinion, I shall no longer again tinker with the machinery of death. The death penalty experiment has failed. So those were two public events, and obviously something transpired. What I didn't know was the whole history of Blackman and the death penalty. And this was, this is my favorite example of the sort of serendipity of doing research in original documents. I think anybody who ever has done that has found the serendipitous discovery. And this was, there was a, a, a series of letters from Blackman to Berger in the 1960s when Blackman was a judge on the Eighth Circuit, U.S. Court of Appeals. He was dealing with a death penalty case a federal death penalty case because it was a murder in the course of a bank robbery. And he, was, he had been assigned to write the opinion for the court upholding the death sentence. He wanted to include at the end his own personal statement of discomfort about the death penalty. He had grown up in Minnesota, which hadn't had an execution since the early 1900s, had no death penalty. It was a minority of states. And Blackman just wasn't, he didn't like the death penalty. He didn't have a completely formulated view of it, but he just didn't like it, and he didn't think it was appropriate in this case. But the law said he had to vote to uphold it, so he did. Uh, but he wanted to have this little personal statement. And a couple of the other judges said, take that statement out or we can't sign the opinion. So he receded, and he took it out, and he really regretted it. He felt he had wimped out. He really regretted it. And what I posit in, in the book and what I wrote in the in this series is that this was his kind of rosebud. You know, and, and he just, it was something he carried with him, and it was a key to understanding the internal conflict that he carried with him the rest of his judicial career. So even though he was, uh, quote, conservative in the, his early encounters with the death penalty, um, because he felt that his constitutional duty to interpret the Eighth Amendment uh, prevented him from importing his personal view of the matter, his policy preference. By the end of his career, he had sort of had it. The court had turned quite sharply to the right on criminal issues. Congress had responded by cutting off various avenues of review for state uh, death row inmates. And he was increasingly uncomfortable, dissenting a lot. So in that final term, um, one of his law clerks, now the law clerks didn't know it was going to be his final term. He hadn't told them came to him and said, you know, Mr. Justice, I've looked at all your, your death penalty uh, stuff over the years, and, and haven't you reached the point when it's time to just say no more? And with your permission, I would like to draft an opinion for you that can be attached as a dissent the next time the court turns down one of these death penalty appeals. And Blackman gave him the go-ahead, and that was the death penalty dissent. So it really... You know, Blackman was very old by then. He was 85 and really no longer at the top of his game, I mean, to be honest. So it was surprising the extent to which this was a law clerk product, but it certainly did reflect his own view. I mean, it, well, they, weren't putting, they were putting words in his mouth in the sense that 
those were their words, but the sentiment was certainly, um, you know, his own, his own view, and it was uh, quite a dramatic way to go out. I remember when that opinion came down uh, that spring of 94. I didn't know Blackman was about to retire either, but it was just a, you know, it was about 24 pages long. It was this long descending opinion from a just conventional denial of cert in a, a very ordinary uh, death row case, and uh, it was it was very dramatic. You mentioned the fact that Justice Brennan had sent a little note to him afterwards. Yes, because Brennan and Marshall uh, dissented in every death penalty case. They just had a little boilerplate phrase, um, believing as we do that the death penalty is always cruel and unusual in violation of the Eighth Amendment. We dissent. They would do this together. Uh, and Blackman didn't quite reach that position. That wasn't his position. His position was, even if theoretically the death penalty is constitutional, we don't live in theory, we live in the real world, and in the real world it just doesn't work right, it doesn't work fairly, it doesn't work, you know, even-handedly, and so I can't, I can no longer support it. It was a, a distinction that mattered to him. It's, a, it is a two different views. Uh, but Brennan was, was supportive. And, and another thing I found in the papers was um, a letter from the inmate on whose behalf he had written this, this dissent, uh, just a handwritten, ungrammatical letter from death row thanking him. Yeah, yeah. I'm a baseball fan, and of course, uh, Blood versus Coon was, was one of Justice Blackman's uh, favorite. 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 Did you get a sense rifling through the papers that you saw a lot of examples of his interest in baseball? Uh, I, I said, yeah, a couple of citations or a couple of notes in your book. Uh, yeah, I mean, yes, and, and I think as people knew that he was a baseball fan, they would, you know, reach out to him or invite him to games or this kind of thing. So it was, yeah, it was definitely part of his life, but um, I didn't find, you know, a whole lot of great insight in the papers on that. No, I'm sorry. I didn't. No, no. Oh. Switching gears here, um, a lot of talk in Washington, most recently Senator Arlen Specter was here in, in Chautauqua, uh, talked about the executive powers and the fact that uh, the case, that, that the Youngstown's real seizure case is the one Justice Jackson was preparing a thing in the, fortunately, in Chautauqua on the stage, uh, so we're proud to talk about that, which is great. Uh, is the, is the Jackson jurisprudence, do you guess, is there a, a sense of that at all on the, on the court? Um, oh, yeah. From your perspective? Well, in, in the Hamdan case, the case that came down uh, in June that, um, that shot down the military commissions that the Bush administration wanted to use to try the Guantanamo detainees, um, Justice Kennedy's concurring opinion cites Youngstown, you know, extensively to say, um, I guess he says, you know, this is category three where Congress has given, set up a system and this is not that. Not only has Congress not authorized this, it's not just a question of congressional silence, but Congress has set up a system for trials of enemy combatants and it's not this system and so this has to fall. Um, so yeah, I think, um, Justice Jackson's legacy is very much alive, and of course, uh, Chief Justice Roberts, uh, who clerked for Chief Justice Rehnquist, who clerked for Justice Jackson, I think sees himself um, in that in that line of dissent. Um, and Jackson's name came up during the confirmation hearings uh, for Roberts, and so um, yeah, that's living history, very definitely. Are you on John Barrett's mailing list? I am. During that confirmation hearing, he was very good at cataloging. Yes. Uh, fourteen times. In case you was wondering. it fourteen? I don't think I counted full fourteen, but yes, I did. That. In fact, I wrote. Yeah. A, yeah, I wrote a little, um, a little sidebar during the confirmation hearings, making a Jackson connection. Hmm. It's obviously, curious to us. Um, the the legacy of, of Chief Justice Rehnquist uh, is that to be written. Yes, it's to be written. Um, it partly depends, of course, on whether the initiatives that he launched, um, you know, outlast him. And the one 
the one that I think is most important, but the future is a little cloudy, is what you could call the Rehnquist federalism revolution, the revival of the notion of a limited set of powers for the federal government, specifically for Congress, enhanced power to the states. Um, it's not clear how far that's going to go. That was kind of petering out <coughs> toward the end of uh, of the Rehnquist tenure. You could say it started petering out after 9-11, mm -hmm. maybe, with some history where, you know, 9-11 was perhaps a reminder that we need a strong and vital national government. So I don't know where that's going to go. Um, but certainly part of his legacy that I think will remain is a very muscular use of the power of judicial review. Um, he would often cite John Marshall, his favorite uh, predecessor as, as Chief Justice. And um, the court really asserted itself in, in this period and is still doing that. Um, and I think given, as you just mentioned, Arlen Specter uh, talking about executive power, I think we've got these two institutions in kind of alpha mode. We've got, you know, the presidency and the court, and um, Congress, frankly, is like nowhere, but that's not my business. But, um, you know, these two alpha males kind of circling each other, and, uh, and we'll see. It's really interesting. Excluding the current justices, are those who you covered, who you uh, when the day was done, you had an impression that he or she gets it? Gets it? Gets it, just as a... Getting that from the, their role as a justice of the United States Supreme Court, however that's defined. Well, I think, you know, Lewis Powell um, certainly had a distinguished career. He's somebody that I covered. Um, uh, justice Stevens has said that Potter Stewart is the smartest judge he ever served with. Um, you know, I, it, it takes a long historical perspective to really evaluate uh, any individual justice because, of course, no individual justice can accomplish anything unless they get four people to agree with them. So it's a, you know, these are hard judgments to make, and I think that's why, I mean, that's really why Robert Jackson's legacy is still something that people care about because, uh, because his voice was so distinctive and he had a way of framing issues and, you know, articulating them that, that transcended whatever his individual vote might have brought him, um, and that very few people who have served on the court have had that kind of voice. So, um, you know, it's hard for me to judge, but um, they've certainly been a, you know, heavyweight set of characters. What's next for Linda Greenhouse? Oh, I, you know, my, my full-time job, and I think it's a really interesting one, is, is um, chronicling the unfolding of the new court. You know, Byron White famously said, anytime you get a new justice, it's a new court. Well, now we have two new justices mm -hmm. for the first time in a generation since 1971 when Powell and Rehnquist came on the court in the same term. And, um, you know, that's a busy job, so uh, that's what I'm going to keep doing. Another book? Oh, I'm not out looking for one. I mean, if a great project landed on me like the Blackman Project did, um, you know, I'd certainly look at it seriously, but I'm not... Um, not looking for extra, you know, projects right now. The Rehnquist papers, where did they end up? Well, unclear. I don't think they've ended up anywhere yet. He uh, did not make a decision during his lifetime, to my knowledge. Uh, left the decision at his death up to one of his sons, who's a lawyer. Um, and I haven't heard anything. I think... I think it's likely they'll go to the University of Arizona in Tucson because the law school there has just set up a Rehnquist Center somewhat, well, no, I wouldn't say not like the Jackson Center because it's going to be law school based. And they just hired um, Sally Ryder, who was the Chief Justice's administrative assistant for the last few years, to run it. So that's a really close connection. He went out there every winter for two weeks and taught a mini mm -hmm. course in their winter you know, inter-semester. Inter so I wouldn't be surprised if the papers end up there, but that has not been announced. Where's Linda Greenhouse's papers go? When the day is done, do you have 
uh, uh, your own diary of stuff that's outside of the ownership of your tent? Oh, I have a lot of, yeah, I mean, I don't have a personal diary and that's it, but I mean, I have stuff and actually um, my papers, such as they are, this sounds too highfalutin, I mean, the world isn't holding its breath for my papers, but they are going to go to uh, the Schlesinger Library on the History of American Women at the Radcliffe Institute at Harvard. I'm on the board of that institution, uh, of the library, and, um, you know, they like my papers and they're welcome to them, but I, they may well be disappointed when they get them. Is there a role model for you? Was there a role model for you? Um, no, actually. Um, no, I mean, I've had a couple of uh, older male mentors in my journalism career, not as a role model. I didn't think I was going to grow up to be them. But people have been extremely helpful to me. One is Anthony Lewis, who really wrote the book. I mean, literally wrote Gideon's Trumpet, but wrote the book on how to cover the Supreme Court. And, and he's been a friend and a mentor in all the years that I've been working at this. Um, and it's a very wonderful person. And, uh, and I had a wonderful editor when I covered Albany, uh, a man named Sheldon Finn, who was a crusty old World War II veteran, old-fashioned newspaper editor, who took an interest in me. Uh, he was the political editor on the Metropolitan Desk, and so he was in charge of the Albany Bureau. And that was a very um, important relationship for me. So those are my, I say mentors, but not, you wouldn't say role models. That's a question people normally ask in the greenhouse that I haven't. Who's your favorite justice? And I'm not going to say. <laughs> uh, who's your favorite non-justice person? As you're in Washington, you've covered Congress, you certainly hobnob with power brokers in Washington. Are those somebody outside the Supreme Court that has grabbed you? Oh, no, my life in Washington isn't really hobnobbing. It's, it's very conventional. Um, I mean, I'll tell you who I was thrilled to meet and this year was a big highlight for me. It had nothing to do with Washington or politics or law, it was the singer Audra McDonald. I had a chance to be her lunch companion at an event in New York, and I was just thrilled to pieces. And uh, if you can ever get her up here, I recommend it. She's really terrific. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's a recommendation. This has been fun. I, I said I would talk to you between 9 and 10, and as that clock is telling you, it's Oh my gosh, you're good. Okay. Thank you very much. You're welcome. And we've